Good afternoon. Uh, you're listening to KFCF 88.1 FM here in Fresno, broadcasting to the central San Joaquin Valley. And I am your host, Kevin Hall. The show is Clearing the Air. Well, I'm your returning host, um, Dolores Weller from the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition, um, is unable to make it today. But we have a special show and a special topic and a very special guest. Um, the topic today is going to be the legislation in Sacramento that is running into some resistance from moderate Democrats from throughout the valley and beyond. And um, our guest is going to be Sandra Fluke, whose name you might recognize from some earlier national exposure brought about by the more right-wing elements of our society. Um, and Sandra is now a, a social justice attorney and the California State Director of Voices for Progress. And that organization is national. Its members are business owners, philanthropists, entrepreneurs, and other leaders advocating for the public interest. Voices for Progress is currently focused on fighting climate change, increasing economic opportunity, and strengthening democracy. Right now in Sacramento, uh, Voices for Progress is focusing its climate advocacy efforts on passing Senate Bill 32, and Senate Bill 350. And these are the topics not just of today's show, but of an editorial that was uh, in today's Fresno B. And if you haven't seen that, you might take a look at it. It's um, kind of a blast from the past. Uh, we went through a very similar fight around air pollution and climate change, not just uh, in the early 2000s when we were getting the first packet of clean air legislation through in Sacramento, but shortly thereafter with the first uh, climate change a uh, big bill, AB 32. So where we are today is we have made it about halfway through the state legislative season. We're over halfway through meaning that if one is going to introduce a bill, it begins in the Assembly or the Senate, and if it makes it through the committees and passes on the floor vote, it then goes to the opposite House, so that that body might deliberate as well. Well, the strategy for many years of the industries that resist regulation and the politicians who serve them is to lie in wait on that opposite House, and um, typically, and again, this is the case, it comes out in the state assembly and by that I mean these two critically important bills that uh, Sandra will be describing for us um, addressing air pollution but primarily greenhouse gas emissions have made it through the Senate they're very good bills for us um, in the valley for the, in the state and the nation if not the world and now just a handful of uh, people who refer to themselves as moderate Democrats um, are holding the bills up and uh, the campaign is on, of course, from people who care about their children's health uh, and the long-term viability of um, this planet um, to step up and let these legislators know that they are very, very concerned about this behavior and that we're very vested in a positive outcome. So to that end, um, I want to just, um, again, remind folks that um, if you want to see a real kind of playbook of, of how these objections are laid out. You could refer to the, the B's editorial today. Um, I think one of the lines that jumps out to me, or for me, is where the editorial suggests that we should not let the perfect be the enemy of progress. But unfortunately, um, we're not going to see progress with what's happening here. We're going to see a status quo, if not worsening, of a policy or a process that's actually working quite well in the state of California on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and creating a clean energy economy. We are booming in green energy, especially here in the valley and in the rural areas of the state. Um, but the vested interests of oil and uh, the utility companies, uh, as well as the trucking industry, are doing their best to undermine our efforts at um, moving forward uh, in a continued, if not increasing, pace. And, um, sorry, I was just um, taking a look to no word from Sandra yet. She's going to call in any moment. Um, so I'm going to actually start um, describing these bills in, uh, until she arrives. Um, Senate Bill 32 is an extension of the original climate change bill for California, which was an Assembly Bill 32 by Senator Fran Pavley. 
simply what this will do is it will require that the state of California as a whole reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 80% below 1990 levels by the year 2050. So there's a couple of key numbers in there, but it's a very worthwhile goal. And um, so that's, that's SB 350. And um, we'll talk a bit of, about SB 350. Uh, SB that was SB 32. I'm sorry. We'll talk about SB 350 in a moment. But I'm told that Sandra is with us now. Are you there, Sandra? Yes, I am. Well, welcome to Clearing the Air. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. And um, I was describing at the beginning of the show um, Voices for Progress. And um, you are the, uh, you're both a social justice attorney and you are the California State Director. Indeed. And how long have you been doing that work? I actually began with Voices uh, at the end of February. So Voices is a national organization that's been around for a, th a few years, working on issues like uh, health care reform and filibuster at the federal level. And we opened our California state office in February because California is, is such a leader and shapes the national conversation on issues like climate change. Terrific. Um, and Sandra, uh, not to bring up the, the past, but I, I think it oh, is... that's okay. <laughs> you're probably used to it by now. Um, no problem. Would, would, would you mind, uh, you probably can describe it better for me, but just would you take a moment just to remind people how you rose to national fame early in your, I believe, as you were still a law student? Sure. Uh, back in 2012, I was a law student at Georgetown Law School. And um, as a result of some work that I was doing on my campus, organizing to make sure that women had access to comprehensive reproductive health care, including birth control coverage on their insurance, I testified before some members of Congress. And uh, unfortunately, Mr. Limbaugh and some others took umbrage at that, and uh, it became a, a bit of a, a political battle to make sure that women had access to the health care that they need. Terrific, and many people actually credit that um, behavior by, and you're very polite, the word mister, <laughs> um, uh, Limbaugh. Uh, My mother always told me to rise above. Very nice. Mine too, right? <laughs> That's a, and it's a, it's a good model. And, and that, that has led to a pretty steady um, uh, falling apart of his um, uh, radio empire, for lack of a better term. But to your current work, thank you, Sandra, for that. Um, uh, SB 350, I was saying in the, in the introduction, and SB 32 are two very important pieces of legislation. I gave the, um, the overview of SB 32. Uh, perhaps you would do the same for us on Senate Bill 350? Absolutely. Well, you can think about this as the 50-50-50 plan, uh, and that's why it is SB 350. Uh, so it has three parts. The first is, and these are all goals that we're setting by 2030, by the year 2030. Uh, we want to make sure that as a state, 50% of our energy comes from renewable st sources. Right now, we have a goal, and we're on track to get there for one-third of our energy by 2020, but we have to keep looking ahead to the future and making sure that we get to 50% of our energy from renewable sources. The next goal is a 50% reduction in our petroleum use in transportation, so instead using uh, alternative modes of transportation like electric vehicles or just walking more or public transit. And then the third piece is a 50% increase in the energy efficiency of our existing buildings. And all this by 2030, correct? That's right. Yes. And um, so this is, um, as I kind of set it up with the description of this as being a, a somewhat familiar dynamic politically in Sacramento is what we've seen uh, more than once in the past. Uh, here in the San Joaquin Valley, we had to move some cleaner legislation back in the early 2000s. And then the fight around the original AB 32, uh, I think there were, again, uh, the same uh, forces of opposition were at play. Um, I, I also described that we've passed the halfway mark in the legislative session, and now the Senate bills are running into resistance at the Assembly. Could, could you describe for us sort of either the political dynamic that you're observing or... Um, a, a general description of sort of the opposition and support for these bills. 
Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, it is all too familiar, and it's getting pretty tired, frankly, mm-hmm. um, because we're seeing not only the same sorts of political divisions, but the exact same arguments, uh, scare tactics, and misleading information being put out into the public, specifically paid for by oil companies, by the oil industry. Uh, the Western States Petroleum Association uh, is behind it, and they, they set up front groups like the California Drivers Alliance and other Others, uh, but it's all being funded by the oil industry and groups that they are very much uh, in control of. And they're putting out really uh, frightening ads for folks about the, that the government is going to limit the amount of gas that you can use or the number of miles uh, that you can drive. And that's just absolutely not the case. And it's the same kinds of arguments that we heard when AB 32 was being passed back in 2006. Things like this is going to cause the economy to crash. This is going to cause cost too much money or cost jobs. And just the opposite has been true. In fact, our leadership on, on clean economy clean and economic, uh, excuse me, clean energy issues Mm -hmm. has helped to strengthen California's economy Mm -hmm. uh, and has created jobs and brought funds back into some of the communities uh, that are hardest hit. Uh, So it's very important that folks understand if they're seeing that kind of press, uh, that that's coming from the oil industry and uh, that it's very misleading and inaccurate about the bills. The good news is, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, go, give me the good news. The good news is that there are a lot of leaders in Sacramento who really do want to see uh, California leading the way on clean and um, on these kinds of issues because they not only want to see the economic benefits, the job creation benefits, but they want to see the health benefits for communities where uh, we have rates of asthma that are too high, and and we want to make sure that we are leading the way. Um, so. Politically, in Sacramento right now, uh, the bills have had a, a strong passage through the Senate, as you said, and they've made it through each of the committees in the Assembly. And now, in the next few weeks, uh, we'll be seeing a vote on the Assembly floor. And it's very important that they are passed by the Assembly and sent to the governor for signage. Well, this takes us full circle um, back to political division, uh, which was your kind of your first point, but maybe we could explore that just a little more. Um, Let me start by asking, is there a single Republican you're aware of who has supported these bills? Unfortunately, I don't think so. I I think the same thing. (laughs) So (laughs) that that leads us to the the Democratic... We we never give up hope. No. They still have an opportunity and they're welcome at any time. We always hope that people will move beyond identity politics and actually consider science and and people's health, etc. So the political division really exists uh, within the Democratic Party, and um, we here in the central San Joaquin Valley are all too familiar um, with the behavior, uh, with one notable exception, former State Senator Dean Flores, but we are very familiar with the um, behavior of uh, so-called moderate Democrats, often referred to as valleycrats, who really um, pay closest attention not to their constituents or their constituents' health, but the voices of the industries that do not want regulation, the businesses that resist regulation. And um, I understand, though, that that, uh, uh, and we met with our local assembly member, uh, Henry T. Perea, here in Fresno a couple of weeks ago, and he told us he was part in leading um, or helping to lead a larger coalition of up to maybe 21 of such moderate Democrats from around the state. Is that the division that you're seeing in your work? Uh, Yes, there is a a group um, that he described that is having conversations and uh, about these bills. Now, you know, I and and others really hope that we will be able to to come to an agreement that maintains two very strong bills that are important for California's health, California's economy, and and for our natural environment. And so I'm hopeful uh, that that group of 21 assembly members will be part of that solution. Um, Unfortunately, we do see some folks pushing for uh, amendments that would weaken these bills. And so it's really important if listeners are able to to call their assembly members and make sure they know uh, that community members, voters, want to see this legislation passed, want to see California leading the way uh, and fighting climate change. And and let's let's talk a bit now about the scare tactic, tactics you were describing. I'm, I didn't ask, where um, do you work? What, what city in the state? 
Uh, I'm based in Los Angeles, but I travel Beautiful. throughout California regularly for my work. Well, but I'm delighted here at LA because um, that's where we have a concentration of uh, Democrats, right? And um, and 70% of the voting population in the state of California is south of the Tehachapis. Um, so, um, and it's a much bigger media market. And so would you describe for us, I don't think many of our listeners, well, certainly not this host, um, watch a whole lot of broadcast news. <laughs> so I haven't seen the ads, right? The oil ads. Uh, um, tell me, can you describe those for us? Well, we've seen some just really ridiculous images, like, you know, moms pushing minivans and the kids <laughs> pushing a, a minivan because California took your gasoline away and rationing. But I, I just want to underscore these are completely false, and I don't want to give them more attention than they, you they don't deserve. Wanna, it's because. ludicrous. Um. Yes, exactly. It's ludicrous. And I think we need to stand up and show our legislators that we as a public are not going to fall for such ridiculous claims. Well, is, uh, do, you, do you see the tactic there as perhaps a, a, an effort to make elected officials nervous, not so much motivate a opposition from, um, you know, constituents? Well, I think that these kinds of ads are being targeted to voters mm -hmm. because... Uh, the industries know that their elected officials listen to their voters. Mm -hmm. So if we call our elected officials, if we uh, speak out on social media, if we email them, they will hear us. So the reason ads like this make elected officials nervous is because they see, they know voters are seeing them. So this is really the moment where we as a public, we as a democracy, as a citizenry, get to decide, are we going to be pushed around by industry lobbyists who don't have our best interests at heart, or are our democratically elected elect, uh, elected officials going to stand up for our health, for our environment, and for our economic interests? And so this is our time to, to speak up and say that we want to see SB 32 and SP 350 passed and to have these be strong bills that will really lead the way. And it's a critically important time, is it not? I think you said we have two to three weeks left in this legislative session. That's right. Folks might not be familiar with um, how it works in Sacramento. It's a little different than, than D.C., which gets a lot more press coverage. But we have until September 11th to, to pass these bills uh, as part of this year's package. And this actually has national and international ramifications. Uh, there was a lot of um, attention a week or two ago when the president announced his clean power plan. Mm-hmm. California is one of the leading states as part of that clean power plan. And so other states are going to be looking to us to see what kind of policies we're putting into place and to show that this can be done. And even more on an international scale, this December in Paris, uh, as the United Nations Conference is being held to come up with agreements between countries about how we'll cut carbon emissions and how we'll address climate change and fight climate change. And California not just the United States, but California specifically, mm -hmm. is becoming a world leader on this issue. So our, our legislative leaders, folks like Pro Tem de Leon and Senator Pavley and Governor Brown, want to be able to take a strong package of climate legislation that we've passed here in California to Paris as a way to encourage other countries and, and other cities and states uh, to also join us in this fight. And that's, that's desperately important. So this is our moment to lead the world, literally. And, and you know, it, it takes you back to the old, uh, for want of a shoe or nail, the shoe was lost and the horse was lost and the battle was lost, right? And, it, and I was making this point to some friends a couple of nights ago. We went um, and did some canvassing uh, in our assembly member's neighborhood quite frankly, <laughs> to say, we got to start talking to our representative more closely. He's saying he doesn't hear from us. And, uh, Absolutely. But, I, and, but to your point, why the oil companies advertise the way they advertise uh, applies to those of us who are going to go out and do it in a grassroots manner. Um, yes. And that they actually do listen to us. And, and uh, I have to say, I like Assembly Member Perea. We go way back. He's a good guy. <laughs> but if he's not hearing enough from, from enough, enough, enough of us, uh, and at times loudly enough, then it's not going to get through. And that applies to every elected official, yeah? So we need to be pushing them. And, uh, and in our role, as you were describing, as leading this, the, the nation and, and setting a model for the world and, and, and other U.S. states that this can work, uh, 
um, people always come back to the jobs and the economy and and the, the opposition fear mongers about that but there's really quite a positive story to tell here isn't there and that perhaps you could outline for us in a little more detail regarding our clean energy economy Absolutely. Um, so because of the steps that we took in 2006 around AB 32 and, and some of the others related to that, uh, we've seen just incredible growth in jobs in clean energy sectors, things like solar uh, specifically. And so these policies that we're talking about passing now, SB 32 and SB 350, will do what we call send a market signal, right? Send a signal to businesses, to investors that California is committed to this path and that there's going to continue to be the types of government regulations that we need in order for the solar industry, the wind industry, other clean energy sectors to flourish and that this is the place to invest. This is the place to create jobs. That's what's happened over the last few years as a result uh, of this type of legislation and that's what we want to make sure uh, we, we see keep going uh, into the future. Moreover, one of the programs that was created as a result of AB 32 and that would be continued uh, potentially through SB 32 is what's called the cap and trade program, uh, which essentially uh, basically charges companies for polluting uh, and makes sure that they're paying for the negative impact they have on the world around us. Uh, and that has created uh, a pool of money that is being used uh, for other projects that help to fight climate change. And that money is being put back into the communities that are hardest hit, that are economically disadvantaged and hit hardest uh, by these types of, of pollution and negative uh, consequences. So there's actually money coming back into uh, the San Joaquin Valley and a number of other areas throughout the state, um, mm -hmm. which is, is fantastic. It is, yeah. I actually was going through the uh, AR, the California Air Resources Board has a climate investment map on their website. And if people are interested in looking at where these investments are going, that map will demonstrate specifically what's happening around us. I. Um, went to a little effort and calculated out Assembly District 31 for uh, Mr. Perea, and his district is fourth in the state for these funds coming back. So we're actually getting a really significantly large share, and that does not even include the, the uh, cap-and-trade funds that are being spent on high-speed rail, and we are home to the first leg of that construction project as well. So... Um, the argument that we hear locally is that we need to get not just our fair share, but our local paper argued today we should get the lion's share of these monies as these impacted communities. But impacted communities are everywhere in this state, are they not? I mean, if you look at the way our cities were planned and the way they were segregated both racially and economically, that um, industry is located next to, next to residential uh, divisions, subdivisions um, in every major city uh, in the state. And, and if you look at the major mobile source pollution, like at Port of L.A., Long Beach, you have a fourth or more, right, of the uh, imports for the entire country coming through that one port with trains. That's and right. I mean, the, the diesel emission levels down there are, are shockingly high. They're frightening. Um, and you look at the oil refineries up in the East Bay, uh, the fires in Richmond, right, that um, we've got problems everywhere, and they're all related to fossil fuels. That's absolutely right, and, and that's why it's actually really important, as the, the environmental justice community has pointed out to us, uh, to make sure that when we're talking about this type of regulation, that we don't just look at what is the emission level for the entire state, or um, can we make sure that there's uh, less greenhouse gas pollution coming from sort of the tailpipe of the car, but to look at what is the impact in particular areas and things like areas where there is an oil refinery. Um, so legislators tend to sometimes think only about the fact that there are jobs related to the oil refinery in their district, but they don't think about the fact that um, some, many do, but some don't think about the fact that there are health consequences for the community that's located uh, around that refinery or communities that have a lot of trucking coming through them, as you said, and can therefore have a lot of pollution and we see higher asthma rates. I think the, the president as well as Pro Tem De Leon have, have both really been uh, uh, 
emphasizing this aspect that communities of color and disadvantaged economic communities really need leadership on climate change because they're the ones being impacted uh, by the negative effects in the most um, immediate and, manner at the moment. And to no surprise, those are the communities where you find the absolute highest levels of support, do you not? For action on you do find you do find high levels of support, um, but sometimes those are communities that are uh, that receive less political attention, and so it's really important that members of those communities are speaking out and are calling their legislators and and making sure that their voices are heard. And I do want to make a point as we wind down here in our last three minutes or so that. Um, the rural areas of the state, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, and by that I'm not referring to the incorporated cities like Fresno, but the disadvantaged urban communities um, are in dire need of uh, everyone's support in this regard as well. And um, and we have legislation in place since 2012, SB 535, requiring 25% of these funds go to the disadvantaged communities you've been describing. Sandra, um, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm going to start giving out a phone number or two for people to call um, do you have any parting um, uh, words or advice or requests? Yes, actually, I just wanted to, to let people know that one thing that happened today that I think really demonstrates the importance of this issue is that we had the majority of the California congressional delegation. So all the members of Congress we send from California, the, the majority of them came out and said, we really want to see California pass these bills. Now, that's not typical. You don't usually have a U.S. senator or a member of the House or Leader Pelosi, folks like that, saying what they want to see that done at the state level. But it is in so important that California does this, that folks in D.C. are looking out for us and saying it's hard to get things accomplished on climate in D.C. because of Republican opposition and climate denial, but we need California to lead the way. Terrific. So that's uh, just what we have to emphasize to our assembly members and give them a call in the next few days. This votes are coming very soon on SB 32 and SB 350. Yes, and here in uh, the Central Valley, it would be really helpful to call uh, Mr. Perea at at 445-5532. That's the Fresno District Office for Assembly Member Henry T. Perea, 445-5532. We dropped off more than 500 signature cards from his constituents this afternoon, uh, calling on him to do the right thing as well. Um, our guest today has been Sandra Fluke, Social Justice Attorney and the California State Director of Voices for Progress, a national organization. Sandra, thank you so much for being with us. We so appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you in advance to all your listeners for speaking out on this. Right on. We'll do it. Talk to you again. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been Clearing the Air, and I'm your host, Kevin Hall. I think we'll hope to see Dolores Weller back next month. It was a pleasure filling in for her, and um, have a good afternoon, and watch out for that smoke. It's dangerous in the mornings.